Nebraska Preps post game with Damon Benning and Jacob Padilla. I love that voice. <laughs> that means it's time to roll. Uh, as the big voice guy said, it's Nebraska Preps post game. That's one of the best in the business. I was kind of thinking about this over the weekend, but I don't like to say it out loud because I you're not great at taking compliments. <laughs> um, and I don't want to make people uncomfortable. Across the state, I've done this a long time. One of the more underappreciated guys that's good at his job, right? It's kind of like it's kind of become the running joke. You know, it's he's very quiet. He's kind of aloof. He likes numbers. He's good at stats. We're really good at his job, too, <laughs> right? Like thorough. That's the word that I came up with Saturday. Thorough. Not going to make mistakes. It's just uh, steady Eddie. That's Jacob Padilla as he gets uh, about the only good thing I'll say about him. <laughs> there we go. Coming up because we're only going to be friends for about two more weeks. Uh, if the Lakers hold up their end of the yeah. deal <laughs> against Golden State in the play-in, we will probably see. We, as I do play for the Lakers, LeBron and I are not <laughs> friends, but I do like AD. Uh, yeah, we might need to take a, a break a little yeah, bit you're depending Phoenix on how that goes. Suns. A very dangerous, and I kind of feel like for what the Phoenix Suns are, they're not quite as bad as the Utah Jazz, but boy, are they kind of an afterthought. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, that's typically how it goes. The, the ones that don't have the, the superstars and the the teams that haven't been there, they just have to go prove it for most people. And Suns have not been there for a very long time, so they're going to have to... Go show what they can do. Um, it, it's interesting, too, because, well, you're an avid Suns fan. It's kind of the cool thing, because I think we'll get about as deep into the numbers with our respective teams as any kind of nerdy fans will. So you're probably not surprised that Devin Booker is third on your team in PRE? Or uh, PER, I'm sorry? Not really. And I I, I think it's it been may, It may yeah. strike the casual fan as, as like, hmm. well, and, and that stat kind of, to, it, it's a little bit outdated at this point. I, I mean, agree. Some other ones, but I agree. It, it's he's kind of settled in. It's interesting to see. It's amazing how, how they, we've only used it, it for out. five, six years, and it's outdated. <laughs> I mean, really, uh, it, it's been a little bit longer than that. <laughs> John Hollinger uh, was working for the kind of yeah, five, six yeah, years ago. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, it's just they've kind of settled into um, Paul Booker, Mikhail Bridges, who's stepped up and um, been. <sighs> He's been amazing this season. He is not getting enough credit for how good he's become. How about Cam? And the elevation, the evolution of his game. He's matured. A little better shot selection. Campaign is one of the best stories of the NBA season. I think mm. there are a lot of really good uh, stories this year, but his career resurgence, where he couldn't, what three, four, five teams uh, busted out with all of them, then suddenly the Suns call him up to to come down to the bubble with them, like. Really, this guy, you couldn't find somebody else that has a little bit more upside that hasn't already shown that he can't play at this level? Well, <laughs> there goes James Jones again, making another yeah. great move, and he just balled out, and he's been playing that way ever since. A pleasant surprise, James Jones, right? Yeah. Some people didn't think he was far enough removed from the game. Yeah, I, I didn't know what to think, especially with him kind of being in there uh, somewhat attached with the Ryan McDonough ball. Era <laughs> and kind of Robert Sarver. He's like, oh, this is my guy. Like It, it, was, kind, it was kind of hesitant when they made that move, but... Um, I, Almost every single move that he's made since has worked out, even though it hasn't been super popular when he made it. So, yeah, so looking forward to it. Enjoy these next two weeks as Jacob and I will will be friends. But after that, all bets are off. Speaking of which, well, let me one one more acquisition. Remember when a couple of years ago when we said things like Chris Paul's contract was <laughs> it's too big last year? Oh man, why this yeah. year? Are you serious? And once again, CP3 shows that he's worth every stinking penny. Yeah, that, and that's just the, the the speed with which they made the leap. And I, I think Chris Paul's MVP candidacy is overstated based on the, the, the trend that the Suns were heading in. And if Aiden hadn't got suspended, they probably would have made the playoffs last year and missed 25 games and had a rough stretch during that time. But to go from fringe playoff team to almost getting the, the number one, one seed. seed in the entire NBA like that that's huge and that's a testament to Paul and then all the the way all the guys have clicked around him and kind of settled into their roles and all of a sudden Jay Crowder is like what year is this again for him <laughs> he just pencils them in for 11 a night and a couple of threes and it's like 
He's going to stretch the Lakers force yeah. quite a bit. He he makes them defensively, but they're going to have to play a little bit awkward because he's a big long body that doesn't go anywhere near the hoop. You've already got Aiden who is extremely active. It's a good thing the Lakers have as many long bodies as they have because they'll need them all. Yeah, and we haven't seen the Lakers and Suns play each other at full strength with both sides going all out like that. The, the one the Lakers won um, this last week or whatever, the Suns weren't running any yeah. of the normal stuff. The last couple of weeks, or last couple of games, the Suns did not run their normal offensive defense because why show, uh, put stuff on tape against teams that you might play in the first round. Yeah. So against the Warriors, against the Lakers, they ended up losing. They played really hard. They tried to win. Yeah, and, you, but they and, didn't, you, and you know you haven't yeah. seen any parts of what the Lakers will be able to do either with the interest in it. Yeah. So. Uh, this NBA six minutes. <laughs> there we uh, go. Uh, brought to you by Jacob Padilla and ODB. Hey, busy week. Oh yeah, busy weekend, man. All over the place with uh, the recruit look. Uh, fantastic facility. I was talking to Ryan Reader uh, quite a bit um, this weekend over at Kinetic. I was kind of torn. I didn't know if I really like Speedway better because of you know where I could see and where it is with relation to the other courts. That's fine. But I, I kind of gravitate towards Kinetic with the overhang and the space with all those courts. Two fantastic facilities, but the bulk of our time spent at Kinetic this weekend in Lincoln. Yeah, and I, I actually hadn't, haven't gone to Speedway for tournaments at all, so I haven't seen what the setup is down there. We never played down there. Uh, but, um, yeah, it's a really nice facility. I'm glad that Lincoln has something that can kind of match some of what we have up here in Omaha. That'll just make it better for everybody getting yeah. getting more good teams into this state for tournaments um, and just continuing to grow the game. And uh, it's kind of funny how things work out sometimes. Um, we we should have been up in Minneapolis this weekend, but yeah, you and me both. The way the circumstances change, ended up pulling out of the deal up there, and I think it ended up being a blessing in disguise because got a chance to see a lot of different teams this weekend that I, I otherwise would have missed. The cool thing about it is and. And we were kind of victims of it. We looked at, um, you know, the the competition in Minneapolis and versus the restrictions and what yeah. hotels were allowing you to do and not do. And I was just there the previous week with my youngest son, and uh, you know, our, our lobbies were closed and um, you had some capacity, but uh, players had to wear masks and things like that. And and whether you agree with the mass policy or not for those kids to be playing, I just you, you have to weigh the risk reward of, of how le level of how comfortable you are versus level of competition. And I feel like OSA is the kind of a whole didn't feel like the competition plus the restrictions, yeah. plus the parents. That, I think that was the limits, breaker. which was yeah. huge. If you're only going to get, you know, 15 parents for a 10 part per team, that's, that's not probably gonna not going to cut it. So. Yeah. Uh, made the decision to stay here, and which I, I didn't love the competition here either. And but I did like the fact if you if you're gonna try to get games in, and it, all things being equal, play it close to home. And and that's the one thing um, about the kind of the showcase setup of the recruit look versus bracket play and some uh, pool and bracket play. Where in, in bracket play, if you if you're in the, the right. Uh, competition level and you take care of business you're going to see a good team at some point because you're going to advance and have a chance whether semis championship whatever however it works out you're going to have a chance to play a really good team most most times with the showcase you're kind of it, it's just up, uh kind of the luck of the draw of with who you get and um same thing for me like we um had two games that um weren't competitive at all and had one game that was we ended up winning by 17, but it was kind of like 10 to 12 most of the way. Uh, and then we had one decent, uh, decently competitive game to kind of finish off the weekend. So it, and it was kind of the same deal the first week with the recruit look. If you're not one of the kind of the name team that they bring in that, that they're really advertising where they're going to match up the teams at the top, then you just kind of have to hope that the other teams that entered the tournament are good enough to, to give you a challenge. I kind of think watching you guys as much as I have and just knowing the individual pieces your team in particular, and there's some others, you're kind of in no man's land because you may be better than what your quote unquote yeah. level yeah. is supposed to be. And so you're always going to kind of be in limbo because you're really good. And I'm not so sure other places have that kind of depth That's or pay the pay attention to as much as maybe you guys and how well coached you are. 
Yeah. And th- that is kind of where we're at right now. We're um, trying to find, all right, where's that sweet spot with, and especially it's tough. with going to be tough with always say you've got the Adidas, you've got national one, we're, we're national two, but I think it's national one, a national one B kind of competitive mm-hmm. wise. So we're good enough to be up at that. But a lot of times, like with the, the Pentagon league, um, they capped it at two teams in the tournament series. Um, so the, the Adidas and national one went up to the top. So we were down in, in the, the second division. So that's just kind of uh, the, the way it works out. But hopefully River Cities, um, everybody kind of goes into, you got a chance, we'll be in the top one, have a chance to win our way into the bracket, should get some g- good games there, and then we'll kind of see what the, the rest of July will bring. But when, when you look at it from top to bottom, and we'll get into some of the, the individual games and the pieces, when you look at it from top to bottom, and you're talking about, um, you know, River Cities will be one way to gauge it. High school basketball is another. Yeah. When you look at the depth from top to bottom, and you've probably done this, what, what 11, 12 years? Uh, 9, 10. Yeah, about, yeah, 9. I think this was my ninth year covering high school. Do you remember the middle of the sandwich being so big? No, and that's, I, I think that's kind of, where the game's going and what we've been doing the last um, uh, last several weeks of this talking to all the different people is where the, the kind of the, the talent at the top end, a lot of that's just kind of, it's going to work itself out. It's going to be cyclical. Um, that's just kind of luck uh, to a certain degree. Obviously those guys work hard or whatever, but the, the talent to be that top echelon um, uh, talent or player isn't, isn't going to come along. Uh, going to have 10 guys every year in Nebraska, but where you can really make strides is that middle that you're talking about where decent, decent players with some good, uh, some good amount of natural talent. They get in the gym, they work really hard. They can get elevate themselves back into uh, that middle tier where you, you can really add depth to the the state and all, all the different teams at, at various levels. When you, when you're recapping the weekend, um, what kind of stuck out to you? I, I know what people say. I'm going to leave the 15s alone here for a second on the, on the, adidas column because i do think that's probably the next great class where and we've talked about this it's not just basketball it's going to be like that in baseball it's like that in wrestling it's going to be like that in track it's going to be like it in football a lot of really really good kids when you look at we go 2022 2020 2023 and and some of the remainder of 2021 are you surprised at how even even at the top, I watched Supreme and um, OSA that Adidas, and with the exception of a couple of spurts, I felt like I didn't just look at one team and say, "Oh man, they're over." They have they're overwhelming them with talent. I watch you guys play. I'm thinking, "Oh my goodness, they should. They may be their. They may be their one team, right on the national <laughs> level." Like I. I mean that game's probably a, a a two or three point spread. I think if I'm setting that line, and we it's won like, by two when we played. Yeah, a see, I would, I would, I would. That's what I would say. Like it is really congested watching all these kids play so close together and such eyeball proximity where I can kind of see and and gather. Like it's amazing. Yeah, and that's fun to see. That's what you want. You want a lot of good teams that can compete with each other. And then go out and compete against the other the teams from other states that are coming in here. You want to see Nebraska teams protecting their home or home court anytime that they're hosting tournaments and they're bringing in Iowa teams, Kansas City teams in particular. Um, we get some Colorado teams that make the trip, so um, that's always fun to see when you see. The, and that's why I like jumping around, trying to see as many different teams as I can, just to get a feel for um, who's doing what and um, kind of ha- how different teams are playing. From a feasibility standpoint, what's the next state? Because I felt like we've made tremendous gains. You can debate whether we've caught Iowa or not. I know they send their best. We send our best. Nebraska wins their fair share of games against their major programs, um, whether it's Mocan or Kingdom Hoops. or uh, at, at once upon a time, it was the Barnstormers. Um, so whatever, right? Who's, what's the next state that you feel like is – should be the 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 target where if you want to continue to kind of climb that that national respect level what state do you think that is it's it's i think minnesota's too far away yeah and and also too minnesota it seems like 
a lot uh, more people in recent years too. They're kind of gravitating towards D one kind of snapping up all the talent. And then <laughs> some of the other teams are solid, but they don't like, I think like in the Sanford league, uh, OSA teams have done pretty darn well against the Minnesota teams. I think for the yeah, because they have the comments and, and some yeah. other it, programs. That- so it's spread out fury and, uh, select and, um, all these different teams. Um, he is, is Kansas yeah. doable. Yeah, that's interesting too. Kind of with the the Kansas, Missouri, the the kind of border there, where a lot of those are Kansas City teams. So it's kind of um, you see a ton of Kansas City teams. Whether Pacers, I mean, eight one six came up this weekend um, from that area, I believe. Yeah, Run Um, GMC. Obviously, yeah. At the top, you've got Run GMC. You've got Mocan. So I think, yeah, if we were looking for a goal, um, that's probably uh, one to, especially because we go down and play. Um, Nebraska teams go down and play in Kansas City, Lawrence, whatever tournaments a- every year. So I think that's probably a good one to look at because you've got the shoe circuit teams up here that OSA and um, fact and Supreme and ha- have gone up against in, in recent years. So um, I-, I think that's probably uh, the one that you would look at. Hey, to the naked eye when you're watching all these tournaments, when you're not coaching your own team this weekend, do you get the sense that that rivals during the school year? are making the nice transition in the summer, or can you still see those teams that for whatever their reason have their chemistry issues? Yeah. It's, it's kind of interesting about that. <laughs> it's, it's crazy, isn't it? Because of the, the collection you have, you've got some kids that do bring the rivalries. Like you've got some kids that you, you they get into a certain matchup and they're like, right, I'm going hard this game. Like I don't like this guy over here on the other team, or they maybe had a bad experience with that organization previously and they've come over and they want to go show out. Um, and things like that. So that's kind of the interesting thing about AU is where guys that go hard against each other during the high school season, they either get together and and work together and play together and go like that, or they go butt heads again uh, in competing organizations. Uh, It's interesting. So what were some of the big takeaways from, from, from this weekend besides your team once again, going four and oh, yeah. Um, I, there are a handful of teams that won four and oh, I thought, I don't know that there was any, Big surprises. I think um, Nebraska Supreme winning the 17s game against OSA. That was what, expected, especially what, with Josh Dix coming off the, uh, the the illness and kind of them trying to. They added Dominic home this week to kind of close out because who, they lost. Who, by the way, I think is a fantastic fit for what that team needs. He's very calm. He's strong with the ball. He's not going to be intimidated. And he doesn't get caught up in the, he doesn't get caught up in all that extra peripheral stuff, right? He, he minds his own business. I liked him a lot this weekend. And then I didn't get to see it. I know he had a big game, and I think their first game on Friday night. Um, so good. And we'll see. Kind of, he'll have a chance to get get acclimated to that team and kind of settle into his role once we get t- towards July. And um, but. Yeah, I think that one expe- as expected. The, the 16s, I think, went a- as expected. Um, Nebraska Supreme um, put up a fight for stretches there, but then OSA ended up pulling away. And the, the big thing about that is their best players didn't play well. It was the role guys. Maul Jall had a great game. Um, Jackson Stuvey made some big plays. Jake Brack made a couple of big plays. It was kind of the collective that stepped up and allowed them to pull away, more so than the top-end talent. And I think that's that's a great sign for that team moving forward if you have continue to get contributions from that, that, that bench unit. Yeah. You know, who's interesting in that group uh, that you mentioned is Stuby. Yeah. Because he works at his game. He's capable of being a very good shooter up to this point. He's proven to be very streaky yeah. though. He's one of those people that I almost wish not that I'm the guy that's like going to get you over the mental yeah. hump. But if I could spend like, I don't know, just like, six, eight weeks with him on just dialoguing the whole competitiveness or the, the, the believing in yourself kind of factor. Yeah. He's so unassuming and so quiet. It's almost like he doesn't even realize he's capable of being a really, really good player. He doesn't have to take very many back seats if he doesn't want to. And, and that's the thing about playing early at the varsity level is if yeah, you struggle good, a little bit point. It can as shake a sophomore, you. It can shake because he, he did have a tough high school season. He was kind of in and out of the rotation, yeah. got jumped at different points by different guys, got his way back into it. 
uh, made some contributions at some point, but he just ball wouldn't go in for him uh, for much of the season. So it's good to see him playing well now and building back up that confidence, like you said. And that's and that's why I like and, like people talk about high school versus AU, and I think they both are very important and they're both very good for the kids because yeah, they're there's a certain way of basketball you have to play at the varsity level. It'll toughen you up going against bigger guys, older guys, um, and playing the way your coaches want. But in the summer, you get a chance to play more free. You get a chance to play against guys your own age uh, and with your friends. So I think that they really do work well together towards building a more complete player by the end of uh, kids' high school careers. Yeah, uh, It's, it's c- kind of going back to um, that 15U team for Adidas that is has kind of been a lot of the talk. They play so many varsity minutes as a team from top to bottom that playing against their own age group, even on the national scale, we saw them go undefeated in Atlanta against really good competition. It's um, it's interesting to watch because of they're used to playing against bigger, stronger kids at the varsity level, even a, Marcus Glock at Wahoo, who gets major minutes as a starter, plays against a lot older, more physical players. A you know, a Maverick Binder plays against a lot uh, a more older. Yeah, I won't yeah. say more physical because I will say this about Maverick Binder. I think he's arguably the next best. He's I think he's the second or third best on the ball defender on that team. Hmm. And that's that, high praise on that team because they they have a they have a very good collection of really good on the ball defenders versus understanding where you need to be with help side and how to play passing lanes. That team coaches defense about as well as I've seen it. And so when you get one or two guys that are very good on the ball and you, you put that with other guys that have really high IQ and good athleticism, it's very hard to make two passes. And that's kind of where they make their, Hey, I, I think Maverick is, Maverick, there's a lot of guys. There's some good guards that he's seen this summer that he's he's guarded 90 feet, and 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 I think that that surprises some people. He had his hands full Saturday night with Buddy Buckets playing against a bigger, stronger guard, and I by the end of that game, I wasn't so I wasn't convinced he was actually stronger. He was just <laughs> bigger, right? So I mean, there I think there's something to playing varsity early. I like the analogy you gave with the combination of bigger, stronger. Versus free flowing, playing on graded. I think both those things go together. Yeah, for sure. And uh, they went what four zero? I believe they split between fifteens and sixteens. Four zero two KS National, uh, a team out of Lincoln. They've got uh, they've got some good players. Uh, they do. Tay Moore is a really talented. I'm not sure how long guard. those guys have played yeah. together. They were a little disjointed. Yeah. Um, so Tay Moore, point guard from Lincoln Southeast. Uh, I know. He, I think. JV varsity swinger a little bit for Southeast this year. Um, he's a really shifty point guard, really skilled. Um, and, and then Kendall Hinton, big guy um, from Lincoln North Star. I think we mentioned so he's a handful. Those two, those two definitely stand out every time I watch that team play. Adidas, obviously. I think those are, uh, and then Team Factory Gold kind of playing different competition level, but they went out and took care of business. I believe um, Malachi Burns from Millard North uh, played well this weekend. Um, you know, one thing I like about them. And I watched them um, in particular, number one, because I was with my daughter, who's a Millard North attendee, and I look at their coaching staff. That's a well-coached team. Yeah. (laughs) They play good basketball. Yep. And uh, Justin Fickle there from Omaha North coaching that team. And and then OSA Crouch. They they play hard. Yeah. That that factory team plays hard. And I, and, and Grant, all by aside, I mean, full disclosure, right? I worked with Fickle at Coach Fickle yeah. at, at North, and I happen to think a lot of him. But I'm not like I can be objective, right? <laughs> if I didn't think he was worth a darn, I'd, I wouldn't put my neck out on the line. But those, they play hard. And it's, it's, we, it, this is just what I wanted to ask you. And you're probably not a great guy to ask because I know what you're going to ask of your team. And I can tell you can tell by how they play, whether it's the team defense or being undersized and getting after the glass. Like, I think to play for you, you have to play hard. But I'll say this. Are you surprised that more teams in the summer just don't exert more energy? Because right now, that's like 50% of it. If you just play hard, you give yourself a chance. But it seems too easy to say out loud. Yeah, and that's... (laughs) 
play hard, play smart is basically my pregame speech uh, for every game with, with my guys. Weird. Like that's, I'm, that's, I'm so surprised. Play smart, play hard, and then play together. That's how we break down all our huddles. So um, that I, I really do think that's the key to good basketball. Like, obviously, in summer ball, you can get out. You can do a lot of run and jump. You can do a lot of trapping, get out up and down, and uh, go kind of play that way, just turn it into an up and down game. I, I, I want, I don't, I'm not a big fan of that style. I, w- I want to help these guys get better. And um, I think that goes on a possession by possession basis, making the right decisions, uh, being in the right spots. Um, so th- that really is, I think y- you kind of see a difference there between the, the kind of the discipline teams that um, versus the ones that are just out there to try to get run outs and that kind of stuff. Okay. So I'm going to take that answer. I'm going to take the fact that you're a Phoenix Suns guy who play with, with pace and tempo. We both cover Creighton. They play with space and pace. Is Jacob Padilla a shot clock guy at the high school level? If that's your mantra, <laughs> that's interesting. Is because I, <laughs> for what I coach, I do coach patience. I tell them, hey, if we need to take forty-five seconds to get a really good look, that's fine with me. Uh, but I, I am in favor just with the amount of games that I have to watch where I'm not involved. Um, I, I don't have hey, to. If coach I'm not the coach teaching discipline and good shots, you other guys, man, play faster. Yeah. I don't want to watch it. <laughs> yeah. And I, in general, I don't think it's a terrible That's problem. A gym. It's <laughs> hey. cut that up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's a massive problem. They're just certain certain teams and certain situations. Like anytime I see a coach, like even before you get to the one minute mark, like pull it out or whatever, I'm like, let the kids play at that point. Like, yeah. 30 seconds left. All right, get into something, get the, get the ball moving, wait to try to get a really good look late in the clock. But anytime you chew off an entire eighth of a quarter, like that's, I think that's going too much. So it's situations like that. And then uh, the teams that do, I, I don't know how many teams that are intentional about just holding the ball versus just really methodical on offense. And I think there's a little bit difference there. Like if you're really playing to get a good look. Um, that and, would be close to the coach Hague at, at Elkhorn. Yeah. Right. Versus. And I don't want to disrespect Coach Weeks because he wins a ton. Yeah. And I think the world of him. But sometimes it does appear as though they're intentionally salting clock. I don't. He probably teaches it to get the best shot. Yeah. So, I, you know, I'm I'm, ad, I'm admitting that I, I may be a little off in just using those two examples. But is that kind of what you're talking about to yeah. some degree? Yeah. And I haven't gotten it. I haven't I mean, gotten far be it yet. from us to, to, to question a guy that's won. I don't know, 25 trillion state titles yeah, at, at, at 22 trillion different schools. But hey, Coach hey, Weeks, man. Good we're audience. we're speaking as spectators here. So <laughs> yeah, that's that's, that's the and point. he's fantastic. Yeah. You know, oh, we yeah. get along well. I just I is that I'm just I'm yeah. trying to get clarity for our listeners. I, I think that's that's right. Those are pretty good examples. And also, um, I haven't gotten a chance to go to the the travel tournaments where they do play with shot clock. Um, and I don't watch a ton of the like televised national high school um stuff. So I haven't seen shot clock in high school basketball a lot in person um so it's hard to say how like what the change would be immediately in terms of improving versus uh making the game tougher for kids obviously you're gonna have to coaches i think it might it's, it'll probably be a t- harder transition for coaches and it will be players because i think players in general like hey they want to go take shots anyway so i i understand media and and obviously being in my my real job and, and endorsements, not endorsements, but commercial spots and revenue generators. Are you surprised that the the American college game still plays halves? Uh, not really. I think it's Who, part nobody of, else is playing it though. I think part <laughs> part of it too. I think is with the uh, I think I heard uh, with the kind of TV uh, agreement and mm-hmm. with the the timeouts and the number and the commercials and, and timing and, and all yeah, that stuff. I, I think I, that's I, part of it. And also, we know the NCAA doesn't like to change. So <laughs> um, it's good to see Jacob Padillo here for endorsing the NCAA. I, I think we've seen it's been a success for the, the women's game. And I think most people over there love the change. So maybe we'll get there at some point. We're, there's coming up with all kinds of crazy uh, experimental rules to, to potentially vote on. Um, so we'll see what happens there. But um, yep, yeah, it's. Hey, you though, um, we still play in halves there. So uh, that that's the other uh, level where you still play it. Um, and if I guess kind of wrap up a few of those. D- DB here for quarters and <laughs> shot clocks. There you go. I uh, just am. I just yeah. saw the difference. And maybe it was, it was, um, 
caliber of competition. But we did it here last year at the field house where we experimented with it was 24 minute halves, but we played with a shot clock. And it was just a much better, it was just a much better game. Um, now in Atlanta, we played with a with a shot clock, uh, 22 minute halves. I, I enjoyed that as well. I know that to go back and forth is difficult because whether it was Atlanta, I felt like that sapped a lot of the guys that traveled to Atlanta versus not playing with a shot clock. Yeah. The the very next week, the games were vastly different. Um, and, and that's the thing, it, like it's not even yeah. the same game. Yeah. I mean, I I think though, you correct me or just give me your thoughts. I, that may be some of the pushback and trepidation. You can talk equipment, you can talk cost. I'm telling you, and I think you'd agree, the game is vastly different. Yep, and, and <laughs> coaches don't like to change. Like, hey, I'm a coach. I you 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 do you have what you do well, like and what you've known, and that's what you coach to, and. Uh, a shot clock dramatically changes a lot of what um, coaches would have to do at the high school level. There's so much more urgency to create offense early in, in the clock. You can't take your time and, and really work for a good look. And at the high school level, the guys aren't as talented as the guys in the NBA and college where they're going to be able to hit a contested 20 footer um, late in the shot clock. If not, not everybody has a guy that can go get a bucket. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> there'll be times where it leads to, um, kind of some ugly basketball, but ultimately I think, um, once everybody adjusts and they figure out, all right, what's the best way. And we'll kind of see how defenses adjust to, um, that's, uh, that'll be interesting coaching towards the shot clock versus what you do now where, um, there, there's no end of the possession. So do you be, get more aggressive? Do you sit back and, um, kind of dare them to, um, take longer shots more? Like how, how do you defensively? Uh, coach towards that so that it'll be interesting to see the way that coaches adjust offensively and defensively if and when this does happen um but i could totally see a being a pilot, class a being a pilot in 22 maybe or something like that yeah i think that's the question here is all right when are they going to try it and it probably will and uh i think sharpie mentioned um gary sharp during our interview last week or um could it be something where they uh experiment with during like a holiday tournament or something like that, kind of a standalone event w with class a you're playing in a facility already equipped with a shot clock. Uh, if, if you're at uh, Ralston again or whatever, kind of that kind of a deal where you've got kind of standalone kind of like the NIT does for college where, right. with the experimentation. So there's a lot of different ways this can go. Um, hopefully it'll lead to better basketball, more entertaining basketball, I guess is the way I would put it. Um, let me ask you a question since it was one of the great debates in the car and you'd think I would know being knee deep in high school sports for almost 20 years. Obviously the Bennings are huge fans of the Millikens and Caleb is in the backseat talking about Connor and he reads to me that he was the BCD player of the year in basketball. It caught me off guard that one guy would be – now, I know it's in track, but that's a little more individual where you can pit it against times and you can have all-class championships and things like that. How long has high school basketball gone to all-class that's not Class A for a player award? Do you know? Uh, so I think that's uh, some – was it the – Metro, Metro coach. Yeah. So that's how they've always done. They've done basically class A and they've done kind of smaller schools. Um, so that's how they've always done it since I've kind of been going and watching and kind of paying attention to that. And I think they're trying to Jacob Padillo here <laughs> for knowing all things, high school classes. <laughs> uh, so I think it's kind of a way to, to kind of recognize a big name, but then also give somebody else some, you know, attention. it's, you know, it's interesting. Because we all know Connor Milliken is really, really good at the Class B level. C1, C2, D1, D2. We've kind of seen this this elevation of really good players at individual levels, whether it's of you know Lucas. Vo there's there's a ton, right? At some point, they may have to change that. Yeah, I, because there's there's so many good players at different levels now, where it's like, do you really feel comfortable? Yeah, and that's. 
I think that's one where they don't necessarily want to give out six different player of the year awards. <laughs> They're or, like, hey, uh, there's only three people in the world that would know all the classes, and two of them are doing this podcast. Yeah. It, <laughs> the other one is busy covering Class A baseball right yeah. now. <laughs> so it's like – And the thing is, like, you've got – from the newspaper, you've got the All-State Awards. There's so many different awards that – all of these people will get a chance to be recognized in one way or the other. So this is just kind of one on top, one of many, I think, awards, the, the Metro Coaches um, Player of the Year awards. So um, I, I think in general, people like Lucas Vogt um, has, a, has a chance to be recognized for what he does at his level um, in, in various ways. All right. And our, our final couple of minutes, um, since neither one of us like beer, I'm going to put you on the Budweiser hot seat. We saw two of the tops uh, this weekend in Jason Green and Isaac Trout for the upcoming year. We saw that in addition to a guy by the name of Josh Dix. When you look at upside, and by the way, how bad do you just want to tell Josh Dix, hey, man, shoot the ball 20, 25 times a game. You're really, really good. You belong on the court with any of these guys. Now, having said that, that's my PSA for Josh Dix. <laughs> um, right? Yeah. Um, how are you kind of discerning between those guys? I would, um, far be it for me to say Isaac Trout is too big, but his, it seems like his versatility and his, he's kind of slowed down a little, like he's a, he's well put together when you talk upside with the high end, highly recruited guys. And I think Dix will soon be in that aforementioned group with the other two. How do you kind of slot that? Yeah, I, I think the thing about Isaac is uh, six nine, six ten. Seems like he keeps growing every time he seems like he said he's getting the weight room now. He uh, is yoked. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and he came out that that first game. Um, they, he's not even as stretchy a four as he was a year ago as a stretch four. Now he's just kind of four. Yeah, <laughs> he may well, just be a four. Well, and he can put on like the it's, the team KC. I think they won by forty. Whatever the first time I watched them this weekend came out. First two plays, catch off the dribble, pull up, uh, bury to three with a hand in his face. Next play, pump fake, put on the deck, up and under, yeah. really, uh, really skilled. nice finish Highly at the skilled. rim on back-to-back -back plays. And that's kind of showing what he is and kind of what his features. And he will go down and uh, make some plays in the paint, too. I think with his physical tools at his being 6'9", 6'10", and again, getting stronger and stronger with that shooting touch, I think he's got, he's got the most upside there. The thing mm. about Jason Green is he's so versatile. We're still trying to, I think he's still trying to figure out, all right, where does he slot in at the next level? Um, Cause kind of about six, seven, um, his so he's a little bit in between. It, he's so crafty. He's got great touch, great feel yeah. for the and, game. And he's very good defensively. So like you put him and William Kyle out there together, oh, who by, by the way, if I'm buying stock and I've got to take it in all these guys, I'm going will Kyle for the win for the future uh, every time i see him will kyle is getting better and better and better like he's top three top five Maybe top three something. defensive players i think in, in nebraska with his ability to switch out on guards and guard them better than your perimeter players at times uh and then also weak side rim protect um i he, when i was watching him he he blocked a shot, like flew over and like swatted it out. And then a couple possessions later, switched out, picked a pockets guard, led the break and dumped it off to a teammate. We're playing after right after the, the, yeah. the showcase game where um, OSA was playing Supreme. And Caleb's like, he's grabbing me on my arm and he's like, man, I would love to be out on the perimeter guarding and funnel to a guy like Will Kyle. Oh, yeah. 100%. <laughs> when, when, when one guy that loves defense is looking at another guy that loves to play defense as like, Whew, wouldn't that be a luxury? Yeah. I mean, he would go up and it would just kind of get dark yeah. momentarily in the arena. His footwork. Yeah. He, so he's a D2 player based solely on his defense right now. Like that is his floor. Like he, he, that's, he doesn't that's need great to do, when you say floor. That's one. Like he doesn't need to show a thing on. If he continues to develop offensively, then you got a chance to make that leap there. Yeah. And I know some schools will be looking. Uh, I'm, I'm glad we, I'm glad we brought him up because if you're going to play the long game, and you want maybe a little cheaper stock that you can get yeah. now and it'll be elevated, that may be your best bet. Yeah. So he, and I think 
of anybody in this class. He's risen uh, over the last year and a half, two years, as high as anybody, um, and showing that he can't. He belongs on that level. Uh, two years ago, he was playing JV at Bellevue West. I don't even think he played summer ball. Yeah. Um, last year, factory kind of showed some things, and now the level he's playing at is, is really impressive and cool to see a kid like that, that to work really hard, get to where he is now. And he'll have some good opportunities moving forward. I referred to him as thorough and complete earlier. He's still that guy. Maybe even up a notch. That's Jacob Padilla. I'm ODB. Next week, well, we're going to try to talk to Ryan Reader. We're going to grab him uh, and make sure we talk about the growth and the evolution in Lincoln as it's trending in that direction like we've been doing. as kind of our little mini-series. But high school starts, and uh, we'll get together and see what that schedule is like. We'll keep you covered from top to bottom. That's one of the best in the business. That's Jacob Padillo. I'm Damon Benning. This is Nebraska Preps Postgame.